He has a master's degree in psychology and has used it to create an innovative training system for faster, better results. Today we talk with Igor about chess coaching and obsession with chess in general. Igor, welcome to October Obsession. Thanks for inviting me. I think that your project is very interesting, very inspirational for people. It would be a privilege for me to take part. Excellent, man. What is chess? In my opinion, chess is an intellectual sport. Let me ask you guys one simple question. Let's say you want to be strong physically. You want to have big muscles. What would you do in that case? I go to the gym and I work out. Of course, that's a pretty obvious answer. But what if we talk about our brain, how to make this muscle very powerful? This question is not that straightforward, right? So here we also need to apply some specific tools. And the same with our physical condition. We need to understand that it will not increase by itself. We need to put some efforts here. And chess is one of the possible tools to achieve this ultimate goal. And when you started training in chess, did you start playing the game? Or were you mindful of, the, I need to train my brain to be able to capture the games? Or how did you come to this conclusion? When did it come in? in of course, not from the very beginning. My very first game I played at the age of five or six years old, and at that time, of course, I haven't thought about that philosophical things. Uh, I came to that later, and uh, I don't remember exactly, but anyway, when I thought about the value of chess and what it gives to me, and actually talking about the value of your project, I also think that enthusiasm or motivation or obsession, whatever you call it, is the key element, really. Because this is what drives you. This is what forces you to do something. No matter what is your goal, in any case, you need to put a lot of efforts to achieve it. And the most critical moment here is your motivation. What really drives you? What will drive you to put hard efforts day by day, year by year, throughout maybe your whole life? And, th and that's why when I started thinking about that, I came up with Bill's so to speak, philosophical ideas about chess. So I, I want to elaborate a little bit more about it. Okay, so it's something that can be... I am a horrible chess player, or I have been. I'm, I'm trying to use the wrong word. I have been, whereas uh, Rod is better. But is it something that I can train? I can truly train? Is it something I can truly, like, get, get to? Uh, I'm really curious about that. Of course you do, Juan. Definitely. I'll be glad to help if you wish. Uh, but in, in general, I think that there is one situation which is typical for many people. I can say that with confidence because thanks to the Internet and our remote chess academy, I communicate with thousands of chess fans all over the world. And I've noticed one situation which is unfortunately common. There is a person who tried playing chess game, was fascinated with that, and then he tried to continue and tried to progress. He studied some books, some video tutorials, and he progressed at a certain, up to a certain level, but then he stuck there, and he can't really progress further. After that, people start thinking that maybe they don't have enough talent for chess. Maybe they just don't have that natural ability for that. Uh, based on my experience, I can say that it is a false statement and fault false idea. That's not true. Uh, a lot of those guys who stuck at a certain period, when they were given the proper coaching, they break, broke through and got a tremendous progress with a few hundred rating points ahead within just a very short period. So I think that it's not a matter of some, some talent. As Einstein said, it's you know genius is 1% talent and 99% of hard work. And I think that it's applicable for chess as well. So Igor, if I have absolutely no talent for chess, and let's imagine I start taking your courses from the very first course you brought out, obsessively studying and finishing each course and then all the way up to the final course. What are my results? Would I be able to beat you, for example? What are the <laughs> exact results of taking these courses? How good are they? <laughs> well, I would be very happy if you would be able to beat me after that. That's the dream of every you. coach. <laughs> you can be better than him. Then it's a really talented coach. Um, <laughs> Anyway, speaking seriously, of course they cannot guarantee that you will become the world champion. Here it's a combination of different factors. Oh, yes, I do agree that there is some natural abilities for chess. Some people digest it easier, a little quicker. That's true. And 
not everybody can become the world champion. You need to start very early and you need to dedicate your whole life to it. That's the very specific thing. And usually you also need to invest a lot of time, efforts, money into that long way forward. And only then you will really succeed or at least have chance for that. But what I can say with confidence is that you definitely can become a strong player. That's for sure. So this is an achievable goal for everybody. And if you study my courses, I don't want if you, I don't know if you can beat me or not, but you will definitely be a strong guy. So how did you said you have to, sorry, Kwame, yeah. go ahead. No, no, it, how did you get uh, tell us a little story, your first time your first encounter with a chessboard and how did that build to an obsession into being an amazing player and then being a coach and just coming up with the system because it's very it uh, it is like the combination is very uh, very interesting and unusual. Lead us through your obsession and how it led to where you are today. The first game I played at the age of five years old or six years old, I don't even remember. My daddy showed me the game and I was fascinated with it. We started playing unlimited quantity of games. I've always been losing and crying. Somehow it didn't discourage me. Uh, and then, I remember, we had two books at that time, only two books about chess, and I read them both a couple of times, just because <laughs> I had no other ones, so I read them over and over again. And then when my parents saw that I'm a little bit crazy about that, they drive me into a local chess club, and then I started to train more professionally, so to say. Of course, at that age, it's hard to talk about real professional training, but anyway. Um, later on, I progressed pretty quickly. At the age of 13, as Ron stated at the beginning, I became an international master and I won already a couple of international tournaments and in youth championships I took some prize places. But after that, surprisingly for myself, I stuck at some point. Although I didn't stop training, I've been training as hard as before, maybe even more, uh, but surprisingly I couldn't really break through and I stuck at a certain level and I didn't really know what to do because I've been training and training and training all the time but it didn't produce the result. Of course it frustrated me and then I realized that I probably need to understand this whole situation that this is a challenge that I need to take and to understand what's going on here and how can I change that for the better. At that time I started to learn psychology I wanted to understand how my brain works and how can I force it to work in the way that I want. <laughs> so I even got a degree in the university in psychology and then after a lot of struggling and research I finally understood how silly I was before <laughs> and I understood what, sh what I should do in order to progress. And, and then of course from one side it was very motivational. I knew what to do. And from the other side it was little bit of frustration because I knew that I wasted a couple of years of my life basically <laughs> on doing useless things. Yeah, yeah. Those things which does not produce results. And, and then of course it motivated me really to share my new findings with other people because I thought that if I wasted those years of my efforts then okay at least I can warn other people. At least I can sh tell to them how to do it properly so that they can start doing it instantly right from the very beginning. And I thought to myself that if anyone would only tell me those things when I was a little kid so that I start progressing effectively right from the very beginning, in 20 years I would already be a top player. And I thought that at least now I can help to other people. And when I started doing some coaching, um, I saw that it really produces great results, honestly, surprisingly for myself. So when the first student told me that he progressed for like 300 rating points within a few months, I didn't believe him. I, I thought that it's just he's trying to impress me. Uh, so I checked at the FID website, his, his rating, and I saw that that's, that's true. And then I was surprised that really my coaching is working very well, even better than I could expect. So my students got better progress than I got when I was young, although I was considered to be a talented guy and progressing quickly. So that's how I ca came to chess. And I, of course, I enjoy it a lot. Now it gives me the opportunity to communicate with a lot of awesome people, very intelligent. And also, if, even if we talk right now, now I can communicate with you and in your very interesting project that will motivate a lot of people. And all of the guys that I communicate with in chess, they are excellent people. And I have a lot of pleasure in, in this activity. 
Chess is a blood sport. When I was in New York and I was at Washington Square Park, I I ventured into a place where they have the, the chess boards one after the other, and they have the practice of the the loser pays, which is irrelevant because it's more and more about it's not about money. But as I walked, I I walked because I'm a very curious type. I did not belong in those halls, and they, I I saw a bird of prey looking at me. Because I was a stranger there. And he walked right to me and he said, let's play immediately. And we sat and he beat me in eight seconds. I mean, it was, it was bloody. Pa, 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 pa. It, it, there was no comparison. It's like Mike Tyson versus me. In Russia, it must be worse, man. I mean, you are the motherland of chess. How is it? Is it like as like, every, everybody around you thinks, or especially as a kid, and you rose from that how, how is what is your insight on that is it is it a is it like it's a it's a national sport in a sort and you succeeded it's like how would I say it how, how does that feel how does that energy feel oh he fell the question was too strong it's oh, oh. <laughs> a great question it's where is it? <laughs> oh, I'm seeing his courses. They look interesting, man. But it's um, I really want to take one. Like the which one should I take? The I think I should get a free trial and see how I am after October obsession. Maybe it's gonna help my uh, my. The series are pretty good. The Grandmaster Secrets and there's an also the other one that's. Professional play or something like that. Which and is how are they, they? Do you just do the, the movements, or he explains why you do the movements? How does it work? He explains the whole thought process that you need to go through in order to make each movement. Basically, what you need, what you need to think before you make every movement. So he's not just telling you move rook this. He's telling you how, why you would why? do that. Yeah, and that's what's so interesting about his books. You're not studying specific opening, specific moves. You're studying more on how to think. On what to think about before making each move. And would you start? Look at the, would you start at the opening one, or would you start at the? No, I would start with the Grandmaster Secrets course. And even if I, but you're a good chess player. If I'm not a good chess player, would you start there? No, no, definitely there because it gives you an overall view of the whole game and how to approach the whole game and not a specific part of the game only. And with that course, you will understand why openings are the way they are instead of just memorizing the moves. No. And it's something, and you buy it, and then you can play it? You buy it, you take the, the lessons, which are video lessons, and then there's a bunch of exercises and training that you need to go through. It's long. It's pretty, it's, they're pretty long courses. Oh, Igor is gone. Oh, okay. yeah. I, I got back. Oh, excellent, man. We are talking about your courses right now. I was uh, uh, zooming through your site. It was very interesting. So we're back yeah, to... Thank you. Obsession with chess in a hostile in a country where everybody prides himself on that. How is that experience, and is there something about the thought process that allowed you to succeed in that? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, do you want to know more about chess in my country? No, about your experience. About in like you, you were successful in chess in a country that prides itself with chess. So it, it uh, I don't. Do you hear my anecdote? It's coming to play chess, and this guy looking at me and. Is it like this in Russia? Is it, or is it more of camaraderie? How is it? Uh, I would agree with you that there are different approaches in different countries. I can tell you an opposite story that you you just just to told to us. Once they played in a tournament in Jordan, in an Arabic country, and that was a local cafe where people uh, drink tea and play board games. You know, the, the Muslims they don't take alcohol, so even in that cafe, although it was late evening, they only. They, Drunk some tea and on all those smoking equipment, Cali and you know, board games, and they played various board games but no chess. And I came with my friends and we brought the chess board inside. We we brought the chess clock and we start playing blitz, those quick games which are very thrilling to people because you have to move your hands very quickly. You have only five or three minutes per game or sometimes only one. Uh, so you're really rushing with your with your moves and, and it's very exciting. Uh, at first, those guys around looked at us and uh, they thought that maybe we were crazy or something, uh, just some crazy strangers. Uh, but later on, around 10 minutes after, a crowd 
crowd of people formed around us. They were very interested in, in this chess game, so some of them knew how to play, we showed them the story to interact, and that was a very friendly, very nice atmosphere. Um, oh, okay. because, yeah, so th that's... Actually, I enjoyed it a lot, because in, in the Western world we tend to approach the chess or any sport as a competition, as, the, as something bloody, you know, something where you need to be uh, really tough, where you, you want to win. You want to break down your opponent, but at the same time, we can consider it as uh, as a pleasant uh, spare time when you can communicate with other intelligent people, and really, it creates that atmosphere. You know, like like a wise book or a good friend, a cup of tea or coffee or an art, all those things that create that positive, intelligent atmosphere. And chess also can do the same. Um, is there a more? Is there a more? Sorry. Okay. Well, go ahead. Yeah. I'm really obsessed about the physical part of chess. Now, for example, you were mentioning now about making the moves really fast. It, it sounds like you really need actually physical, agile hand movement techniques to make the moves and to make captures and, and push the clock. Does that affect in any way? Do you actually practice moving the pieces fast? Well, not really. Well, of course it comes with practice. When you play a lot of Blitz games, it will help you just to be accurate, not to throw pieces on the board, but to place them accurately exactly on the square where you intended to place it to. Anyway, I wouldn't say that there is something specific here. And also physically, can you make any type of gestures? Because, okay, here in Chile there's a plaza where everybody sits down. We have a lot of tables and people just sit down and play. And of course there are the typical people that go every day obsessively, they play every day and you start recognizing them. <laughs> Most of them are kind of crazy in the sense that they make all these faces while they play or the gestures they make when they make a move with a piece or how they capture one of your pieces. Are there like any physical things that people do in tournaments or that you do to actually intimidate or distract your opponent or things like that or is that just bad play? <laughs> Besides chess, I do martial arts, and once my coach in boxing, he told me this. You need to try to attack from different angles. So when he knew that I'm a chess grandmaster, he told me, so first you try your opponent on a chessboard, you try to attack him there. And then, if he can withstand that, then just try to deliver a hook. And see <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> nice. It's a game. Um, on a serious note, well, I don't know. Some people believe in that, you know, staring face when you really try to intimidate your opponent. Uh, some players even consider to have a little hypnotic skills, like they're uh, hypnotizing opponents with their eyes, like former world champion Michael Tal, or even the current world champion Magnus Carlsen. Some say that he's somewhat magician, you know, that his opponents make obscure mistakes that they would not make against other opponents. But honestly, I don't believe in that. I think that, you know, luck is always on the side of strong players. That's that's a very easy explanation. Is there a Continue. move... Wait, sorry. Rod, go ahead. Oh, go, go, go. Well, just one more. Continuing with the concept of the physical thing. Is there any type of board or style of board, chess board, that you prefer or have a fetish for? Basically, do you still have the first chess board that you got when you were a kid or how does the actual board affect you when I play in tournaments? Sometimes the pieces are broken and that really perturbs me. <laughs> it was really distracting or I prefer the board which is actually table and black and white instead of the green and white colors. Is there any kind of obsessive weird fetish that you have with chess boards? Luckily not, although at the beginning I really had a lot of them. When I was just a kid and playing in local tournaments, um, luckily I won some of them, and all the time they gave me as a prize the chess set. I was always shocked with that. I thought, do, they, do those guys really think that a chess player does not have a chess set yet? <laughs> anyway, they always presented me a new chess set and I had a lot of them. Later on I just started to give them out <laughs> to different people. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I knew that you could ask me that question, so I even brought the, my first chess board with me. Here it is. Oh, nice. This is a very old one. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's maybe 25 years old or something like that. I still have it. Although it's not like like a fetish, <laughs> it's just it's, it's still with me. I would agree with you, Rob, that I also prefer the classical chess set with a wooden board and wooden pieces. 
turning back to what I said a few minutes ago, I think that creates that really nice feeling, that mood, you know, of an intellectual game. Because you can play on computer, but this is an electronic device. And it does not have that, you know, spirit of chess, spirit of that very old royal game. The excellent. I, I'm going to get it. I have a record player I got on Saturday, and I'm getting a wooden chessboard today. <laughs> it's a, I'm going to get my house. Now, one question I have, is there a moment where you're playing someone and you say, okay, this is a real game? Is, is there an intuition? Is there a move? Is there, I'm not saying he will beat you. I'm not saying that you, know, you will. It, 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 it's only like I need to take, because you often see grandmasters, they, they have this game with 20 people at once, right? And obviously, because they, they kind of know the, the foibles and mistakes of, of they're, they're so common and so clear to them that it's, but is there like a move that you ah, uh, does that really happen or is it just a figment of my imagination? Sometimes there are critical moments in the game where you need to take time and to make that critical decision. You know, in chess game, initially there are like two armies, black and white. Chess is a model of war, actually. And at the beginning, that's pretty simple. They just deploy their forces, move them forward. And at a certain point, there is a moment of collision when they meet each other. And here, this is the critical moment where it, it will decide who will be on top, who will overcome in this battle. And at this point, usually you need to be very wise and you need to think very well and find that right move that could turn the game in, into the direction that you want. And that can really be the, the key for your future win. So, so it's I, at the point of attack, there's like five or six moves from the beginning to the maybe two moves forward, three moves forward, where you kind of get a sense, is this attack cogent or is this guy just moving pieces, right? Would you, would you characterize it this way or no? Well, the wise strategist should know it in advance whether this attack would be successful or not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry, um, when I see soccer games or American football or rugby, the role of the referee there is it's pretty obvious, kind of, right? What does a chess referee do? <laughs> what is the role of a chess referee? It looks like the chess game is kind of passive in a way. I, I can't imagine fights going on. Actually, I can, but I just want to state the question to you. What is the role of the referee in a chess game or chess tournament? How, how important is he? Well, the role is minimum. That, that's right. Unlike other kind of sports, the referee... Generally, it would be very nice if, if he would not participate at all in the game because it means that everything goes flawlessly. There are no conflicts. Sometimes people may climb a draw at some specific situations. They might um, apply for an arbiter if their opponent do something wrong. But normally, there is no reason. If both players behave properly, there is no reason to engage an arbiter. Have you seen any conflicts there? Any any fights to say during the tournament or games? Are people like really that passionate, or maybe in informal games? Uh, at really huge tournaments, usually not. Although some players they start, you know, not shaking hands, saying that they don't respect each other and things like that, or come uh, with those black glasses, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> from the fantastical film, the guy, the superhero. <laughs> Um, but in local clubs, that happens a lot, especially when kids are playing. They're very emotional. Pretty often, if they lost, they can, you know, throw away the pieces or something like that. There was one guy in in England. My friends told me about him that when he lost the game, he always stand up, abused everybody around, and went out from the hall. But that that's an exceptional situation. You know, that's just for the sake of joke. Uh, I'm telling this normally. All people are nice, and there are no such issues. Cool. What's up? What's up with the bishops? I've seen in your training courses that you give a lot of importance to the bishops, even over the horses. Because technically speaking, when they give scores to the different pieces, the score given to the horse or to the knight, sorry, and the bishop is the same. I think it's three points. But you teach that winning, uh, capturing a horse and remaining with a bishop is actually a big advantage. It's actually one of the secrets you mentioned. So what's going on with bishops? Well, firstly, 
since you mentioned horses, let's just compare. Have you seen the horse and the and you know like in Russian, by the way, the bishop is called an elephant in in Russian I'm chess set. And and if you compare a horse and an elephant, it's pretty obvious who is stronger, mm. right? Okay, Be, being serious, um, that's a common delusion that those two pieces are equal. Uh, because uh, manuals for beginners say that, that these are two equal pieces, but this is a simplification and that's not exactly correct. Normally, in order to compare the piece's power, you evaluate its uh, scope of action, how largely it can affect you know, the, the different area. And if we compare the knight and the bishop, we'll see that the bishop is, is much powerful in terms of the area that it can control. Standing on the center of the board, it really controls the whole board. That's why a bishop is more powerful. And people noticed a long time ago that bishops very often are uh, crucial pieces because uh, they put constant pressure in a certain direction and that they can determine a success or a failure of your attack. And while with the knight, well, in most of the cases they are active. You can uh, jump it on a nice square pretty easily. Uh, but with the bishop, it's possible to be either completely passive or very active. So the possible range of activity of the bishop is very huge, and it can affect the overall evaluation of the whole situation on the board. That's why very often bishop is the key. Cool. If you, let's imagine there's a, a table right next to you, a chair where you're sitting down. On that table is your first chessboard that you just showed to us. Who would you dream of playing against? Who would come over, shake your hand, and sit in front of you to play maybe the final game of a tournament? Uh, once I met Garry Kasparov, who was uh, one of the greatest players when he was active. And maybe he's one of the greatest players ever in chess history. And it was very pleasant to meet with him and to communicate with him. He's a very energetic person. Perhaps this is common for all successful people. He's very energetic, he's full of ideas, he always wants to deliver something, to do something, to change something in the world. Um, so I would definitely be a pleasure to play against him. If talking about players of the past, I would select Capablanca, the former world champion. I'm impressed with the clarity of his games. And he's also considered to be one of those natural uh, talents, natural genius, who uh, just took it easy, who, like, w without any significant efforts, uh, got to the very top and ultimately became the world champion. Uh, I think that it happened because he was able to recognize those uh, strategic principles that uh, drive the chess game, that can help you find the right move easily. And I I'm trying to do the same in, in my chess courses. That's why it would be very interesting for me to communicate with him or to play against him. Nice. You know, when I was really obsessed with chess, I've gone through stages of that. Um, it actually brought me problems in the sense of balancing it with everything else, and especially with my partner or with my wife in those moments. Because um, basically you get so obsessed that you leave a lot of things aside. And then at that point I was thinking, maybe I should date uh, a female GM, and then there wouldn't be any problems. And when I look at pictures of female GMs, they're actually pretty cute, which is surprising to me. What's the relationship there between chess players um, in that kind of level? Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. I can be an expert here. I also married a female <laughs> chess player. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody now asks us, do you play chess between each other at home? <laughs> no. Uh, and do you? Well, actually, <laughs> surprisingly, almost not. We have other things to do. Uh, okay. Just we have a lot of chess at work anyway. She is, she is also she's a coach for kids in chess, and I'm also a coach, so we have enough chess <laughs> at our working activity. Um, anyway, the the women chess players, of, of course, a lot of them they are intelligent, they are cute, a lot of them are are awesome, and and I know it's it's pretty pretty natural to have a relation with them. I know some couples amongst chess players. Um, there is even one proverb, so to speak. Uh, between chess players, they say that a good marriage will guarantee you additional 100 of rating points, and a bad marriage will bring you down 100 rating points. <laughs> and you saw some example that this is true. Uh, really, sometimes uh, a nice female it can boost your results, it can motivate you, uh, and it, it happened with some people. Uh, even their wedding trip, they made it to the wedding trip to the tournament. 
there is coming back to uh, um from the what people know and think about chess, and I'm the outsider now. Is it different the skills that a child?